heard about GPT-3. Today we're going to talk about what this model is, what it can do well, and some of the limitations and drawbacks and things it's not really suited for in NLP for developers. Put simply, GPT-3 is a very large language model. And what I mean by that is that it is a model that can take in uh, a seed string of some text and then probabilistically predict what token should come next in that string. So it's sort of like autocomplete on the phone keyboard where you start typing and then another word will be suggested and you continue to just use whatever word it suggested next. What sets GPT-3 apart from earlier models is really its size, the number of trainable parameters that it has. So these are weights that will need to be updated during training. Uh, GPT-3 here is the green line, and you can see that the first version of GPT, or BERT, which at the time were considered very large models, are almost invisible on this graph where the axis is the number of trainable parameters in millions. In general, the more parameters that a model has, the more data you need to train it. And GPT-3 was trained on a very large data set. So it included Common Crawl, WebText2, which was developed by the authors. Um, there are also two corpora in here, Books 1 and Books 2, that um, I don't know what's in them. And finally, Wikipedia. In terms of architecture, GPT-3 really isn't any different from the original transformer architecture proposed by Vaswani et al, except much larger. It's a little different from BERT, another well-known large neural language model. So BERT is designed to take in raw text and then produce embeddings that can be used in other machine learning applications down the line. In comparison, GPT one through three all use just the decoder half. So they take in embeddings and then they produce text. One question that's come up quite a lot is what does GPT-3 know? Is there some sort of intelligence at play here? And the answer is no. So uh, there's nothing in the training of GPT-3 to uh, try to create sort of a structured system of knowledge about the world. And the task that it's been trained to do is to predict the next word. So if it happens to say something factually correct when it's generating language, that's just a side effect of this prediction task that it's been trained on. It also means that generating factually incorrect information is not a flaw of the model. That's just something that it does. How is GPT-3 used? In the paper, the authors propose a really large number of tasks um, that they can complete used when what's called few shot learning. So you prime the model by producing a couple of examples of whatever the task is, and then the model will continue to autocomplete and give you, um, hopefully, <laughs> new examples of it completing the task. The benefits of GPT-3, um, a big one is that the text sounds more fluent, so it seems more like something a human might write. It's, it's grammatical. It's also a single, very flexible model that can be used on a number of tasks without a lot of specialist knowledge. So what you would need to do is provide those examples for the few shot learning and then use the model to continue to produce uh, more examples in that frame. And this means it's conceptually simple to use. You don't have to have deep understanding of NLP in order to try this approach. There are pretty big drawbacks. So a big one is that this really is predominantly an English language model. 93% of the training data was in English. It's also very, very expensive. So as I mentioned, 175 billion trainable parameters, and that's a lot. Compute cost from uh, OpenAI is around $12 million. Access to the model is through an API. It is currently closed. You have to be invited to use it. And because it is so large, the likelihood that you're going to be able to train a version for yourself is very low. It's also difficult to compare to previous models. So I mentioned that the authors tried to compare it to uh, specific benchmarks. So in order to reformat the problem to the few shot learning where you provide examples and then the, uh, the model continues to, to produce output, you are really changing the, the structure of the task a little bit. So it's not a completely equal comparison with other models. And also, uh, there is a problem that the authors acknowledge in the paper included in the training data for GPT-3 was some of the test data, so that the system might have already seen some of the answers. Another really big problem with GPT-3, well, I shouldn't say a problem, it is a thing that is true, and if you assume that it is not true, that's when you're getting into problems, is that it's not grounded. So uh, GPT-3 may have some sort of 
proxy of information about the world and the way things are and that they relate to each other, but it is not structured, it is not formal, it's hard to check, uh, it's hard to evaluate, and it's hard to know whether or not the text that you are producing uh, using this, this approach is factually correct or not. It's not that the model is broken, it's just not part of what a language model like this is supposed to do. It just predicts the next word. It doesn't say things that are true about the world. That's a different task. And finally, something to be aware about is that the output will be unpredictable. Uh, and also, given the training data for the model, there is abusive language that could be output and also um, a lot of negative stereotypes, racism, sexism, homophobia. So very important to know. Some common errors and gotchus. Like I mentioned, most people don't have access to this model based on discussion around it. A big one is just misconceptions about what this model is and what it can do and how you should apply it. Again, all it does is predict the next word. Another thing, and this is something that the authors mention, is that longer outputs tend to degrade. So the more text you ask the model to produce, the more likely it is to become nonsensical, to start repeating itself, um, to sort of add weird little tacked on things at the end, like half sentences. Another problem, and this one is on humans, is really cherry picking results. So a lot of the things that have been shared of GPT-3 doing really cool, interesting stuff have been picked by humans, in particular the sort of uh, narrative or fiction or um, essay outputs from GPT-3. Often um, a human will produce several of them and then pick the one that sounds the best. So it's not really um, a good representation of the raw output of the model. And the fourth point, I have seen more discussion about this than it actually being done, and that is serving raw generated text, again, from this model to users. Um, like I mentioned, it will be factually incorrect, at least some of the time. Some more resources. There's been a lot written about this particular model, so I'm going to stick with the ones that are related to RASA. We actually went through and read the paper, um, me and Vincent, so the videos are on YouTube, and I'll, I'll link them in the next slide. And we've also written a blog post discussing some of the early experimentation we've done with GPT-3 and some of the places where we think a neural language model like this could fit into your uh, conversational AI development process, um, although again, probably not to generate text to send to users. All right, thank you so much for joining me today. I know this is uh, a topic that there's been a lot of discussion about. I hope you found this helpful. It gave you some new perspective and insight and a better idea about when to use this model in your work. We'll see you around.